Are you a cell storage owner or operator looking for service providers to help at your facility? Well, the Storage Business Owners Alliance, also known as the SBOA, has you covered. The SBOA is the premier online hub for connecting cell storage owners and operators to industry-leading products and service providers. We provide one-stop shopping for your business with exclusive offers to save time and money. At the SBOA, we believe by coming together, we help owners and operators grow revenue, gain purchasing power, reduce expenses, improve efficiencies, and increase profitability. We also offer many resources such as our conferences and cell storage unlock webinars to help cell storage owners and operators gain the knowledge needed to become more competitive in the industry. To become an SBOA member or to find out more information, please visit www.thesboa.com today. We can't wait for you to join the Alliance. Good afternoon and happy Thursday, everyone. Thank you for joining another Self Storage Unlocked episode. Today, we are talking all about the pros and cons of investing in self storage or finding some partnerships that may be advantageous for you. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jessica Johnson. I'm the vice president of the SBOA, and we're happy to have you here and hope that you get a lot of learning today from this session. I have two rock star panelists with us today. Um, and before we get started, I just to go over a few quick housekeeping items with you. You'll see, and I see a lot of you already commenting in the comment or chat area, your name and where you're from. That is where you can interact with us live. So if you do have questions for our speakers today, please ask those in the comment section. We also have a poll section to the right side of your screen. If you could click on the poll section and answer those polls for us, we would greatly appreciate it. It just helps us to get to know you a little bit better and learn how we can better help your company um, and your journey in the self-storage industry because we've been doing this for a really long time and we just want to help you get the best out of your experience. So a big thank you today to Patriot Holdings and Self Storage investing.com without groups like this coming together with us to help put on these educational webinars we wouldn't be able to do it so before i announce our speakers i have a word from these two companies stay tuned hey guys jeremiah boucher here patriot holdings thanks for coming by the website so i've been in real estate 20 years now and i'm constantly looking for the edge in the space so i focus on alternative commercial real estate assets so what does that mean? Well, traditionally it's been manufactured housing communities. I bought manufactured housing for 15 years and we continue to because there was a niche in the marketplace. Now over the last seven years, I've been focusing on self storage facilities. There's a huge demand for this space and there's a lot of opportunity out there. Right now our company's building the fastest growing storage facility brand in New England. It's called All Purpose Storage. Our goal is to be a top 10 owner of storage throughout the country. We're hyper focused on this. And how do we get there? Well, we get there by being fully integrated. What does that mean? It means that we have an acquisition department and we are grinding on the phones, finding deals before anyone else does. Two, we have an operations department. So we're hands on with the management. So we, we know our customers, we drive revenues, we're raising rents. Three, we got a construction team. So that construction team is building from the ground up. We build at a low cost basis and we create value. We don't just sit back and wait for someone else to give it to us. Four, we have an accounting team. So we focus on reporting to our investors, full transparency. So you guys know what's going on and when it's going on. And then lastly, we have in-house marketing. So we control our AdWords. We make sure that we have a presence online so our customers find us at storage facilities and we continue to keep them rented. Awesome. Well, I'm going to bring up my first guest. I have Jeremiah Boucher with us today. Hey, Jeremiah. Hey, hey. Thanks, guys. 
Yeah, absolutely. Jeremiah, I mean, that was a pretty good uh, welcome video there, but go ahead and give me the skinny on you guys and what you guys are doing. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to be playing it. So that, that gave a little <laughs> bit of the background. So that's cool. And I, I just got to wear my headphones so I can hear you guys. But uh, the uh, so so I'm passionate about storage. You know, Jessica, we've met over the last few years. And for me, I'm in this phase of my career where it's scaling the company. We have a uh, 2.2 million square feet where we'll be up to 3 million next year. And, you know, I've been growing by raising a series of funds. Uh, we're, we've raised about $100 million in capital. We have roughly 340 million assets under management. So right now, I think we're just wanting to grow sustainably and digging into more of the operations, the reporting. Not so much the focus is grow, grow, grow. It's more about really sit, cultivate and refine what we have and make good decisions moving forward. So that, that's the, the phase I'm at right now where I think we'd like to be in that you know, upper tier in the, the top 20 storage owners in the next few years. But we really want to dive in internally first before we, uh, we, we really just like focus all on grow. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, when we had our portfolio, we were in that top tier for a long time. We have lots of awards sitting in our office, so I hope you make it there. I know you'll make it there. You're pretty tenacious. So. Thank well, thanks you. Thanks for being here with us today, and I'm going to move on to our next guest, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Kevin Harrington, an original shark from Shark Tank. Become financially independent without the hassles of tenants, toilets, and trash by investing both actively and passively in self-storage. Recession resistant with relatively high returns, investing in self-storage is more beneficial than other forms of real estate. Start making your money work for you so you can live the life you've always wanted. Since I began my real estate career in the 90s, I've become an expert at teaching others about the business and how to avoid the same mistakes I made when investing in self-storage. We are here for you if there's any way that we can. Self-storage investing trains people how to actively find, evaluate, purchase, and manage self-storage facilities by helping them get into their first facility and teaching them the skill set to do so repeatedly. From passive investing to education to the mastermind group meetings, self-storage investing has it all. Get started the right way by visiting selfstorageinvesting.com today. Awesome. So I'm going to bring up my next guest. I have Scott Myers with us today. Hey, Scott. Hey, Jess. How are you? I'm doing well. And Scott's taking a break from one of his masterminds. He's so kind to do that and be with us today. So you all are privileged for that. Uh, Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing in the self-storage industry. You've been around for a while. Uh, we've been around for a while, and um, guys, my intro is uh, almost the same as uh, as my twin Jeremiah here. We are, uh, I too was surprised and didn't know that my uh, staff was going to send out that video over as well. It's uh, I think only the second time I've seen that, and we're really <laughs> at about the same place. I've been in the business uh, since 2005, and we're approaching three million square feet and uh, about 15,000 units nationwide. Uh, been investing for since 2005 and then teaching since 2007. And what we've done is uh, we created an education company to be able to teach people the right way to go out and invest to, to both uh, buy, to raise capital and develop self-storage facilities, and then created a lot of partners along the way as well. And so uh, a small army of folks that are going out and we created self-storage assassins all over the country to go find the best deals and the best opportunities to uh, develop and and uh, and then also extended our our capital and, and our equity raises through a lot of our strategic partnerships uh, as well and so again just like jeremiah we're um right now we're scaling to get better not necessarily bigger we know that there's going to be many opportunities coming down the pike this will be my third recession and uh, although they're all different, we know a little bit about what to expect. And, and the last time around, I can tell you, I wish I had more uh, equity and more lending partners and that we had our, our back office in order. And so this time around, uh, that's what we've done since 2009. We've been uh, creating more equity partners, greater lending relationships, and then just tightening up our back office operations and getting prepared for the opportunities that are going to be coming up as we head into this next uh, downturn in the economy, because we know self-storage does well during it. It sure does. And it's coming. So I'm going to bring Jeremiah back up so we can get things kicked off and rolling. And it's funny you mentioned you you said you've been through three of the recessions. This will be my third. So uh, yeah. we're through in 99 and 2000. I was in single family houses and apartments, and that was not fun during that time. And then uh, in self storage in the last one and, and just uh, we did well as storage does. I just wish we would have had yeah. more lending relationships and more equity and cash available to to take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've been preparing for ever since then. 
Yeah, the, the 0809 is when we had the biggest uh, turn of growth. We bought 70 properties within those two years during that recession. Um, yeah. It was easy to do then. Uh, not so much now, right? Uh, right. The deals are tough. Uh, <laughs> acquisitions are getting harder and harder to come by. Interest rates are going up. So for those of out there that, that know the SBA way, we really do cater to the smaller, more mom and pop tertiary market or even newer owners looking to get into the space. So my first question for you guys, because you've been doing this for a while and, and you've kind of perfected the craft, what would you advise a new self-storage owner um, in the beginning that's looking to get into the industry, like how to even get the funds to do maybe their first project? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I can start off if that's all right, Jeremiah. I think, yeah. um, you know, the, you're the educator. I'll chime in behind. <laughs> you. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Right. I'm like going to take so many notes on this one. <laughs> well, no, no different from beginner to what we're doing right now. The basics are the basics and the good business practices are good business practices. And so that is just, um, first of all, in the beginning, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So coming up, having a partner come alongside of you and starting from that standpoint, sitting back and watching other folks that are in the business and that are already doing it is, is usually the best way. But you also, you got to know um, the lingo, the terms to be taken serious when it comes to talking and having, having those discussions with sellers and, and with brokers as well. So to be somewhat educated, to even have a seat at the table. But beyond that, um, you, you need to go out and start. You don't have to wait to be an expert in the industry as well. There's many folks that aim, 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 aim and never fire. Uh, but but if, by the same token, just making sure that you have somebody looking over your shoulder, especially for the underwriting, and then perhaps introducing you to some of those lending relationships and leveraging the success that you've had in, in your other business ventures, whether it be real estate or outside of that, to, to build up your credibility and your resume so that when you have those discussions with the lenders that they take you seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremiah, when we were doing the discussion beforehand of this, you know, you said no one's going to go into their first deal and raise a $25 million fund, right? We're really going to probably rely on maybe some friends and family funding. Is that kind of how you got started? And what was that process like for you? Yeah, I think the best way to do it is start with an individual partnership. Just, just, you know, like you get educated, like Scott said, you hit all the, all the main uh, fundamentals of doing a deal. So jump in, understand what you're doing. But then for me, it would be, you know, and how I started, like you said, Jess, was realistically just start with one partnership, one deal, really focus on mastering that one deal. Don't worry about growing. You know, it typically with storage, you know, we the deals are around one to 10 million. I mean, they're not going to they're not going to vary much from that. So, you know, do do the math, like Scott said, on get your underwriting, understand it and understand, OK, I'm going to have to raise. $500,000 in capital, you know, who do I know, get start having these conversations that you really you start to understand the business and get out there and then find a deal. So that way you have that one opportunity that you can actually present the deal. So you're not presenting some abstract concept that I'm investing in storage. I'm, I'm investing in this property here. This is the these are the positive attributes. And what's funny is that our stage, you know, Scott and I, he, he interviewed me a, a few months ago. And he was more excited about this little 30,000 square foot value add that you could double the size and bought from a mom and pop than he is on a, on an $8 million multi-story deal. So, yeah. and I, I still am too. So honestly, so yeah, I think the gyms out there, the thing that gets me so fired up, I love and this. I think it's the best form of commercial real estate that you can entry level into is the smaller mom and pop facility under 30,000 feet that you can expand that you're near Walmart, Tractor Supply, Dollar General, you got some visibility, you polish up the sign, you pave it, you paint it, you light it, you fence it, you put the cameras on there, you pick up the phone. I mean, that is just such a good business model. Like it's, and then just go to Scott's course, figure out the basics, and then go out and talk to a lot of people and get excited. Like right now, I'm 41. I was, I was so fired up at 25, and I didn't know anything. I went to a little Tracty seminar, and I said, damn, I want to, I want to build one of these storages, you know, and I, I, and that, that came through with all the sellers on the other side. They're like, this kid looks like he's 12, but he really is happy and he's excited about what he's doing. So that, and that, that really, these older guys really appreciated that. So if, I think that is the focus, just get good at one of these assets and then worry about scaling. Yep. Yeah, for sure. You've got, you've got to start right with the one, perfect the one and then grow from there. Um, so I took the, look, 
PPLF. I took that acronym down, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, pave it, <laughs> paint it, light it, fence it. Like I think I'm gonna run with that one. Um, and then cameras with a C. <laughs> okay, then we'll put the C at the end. PPLFC. We'll make yeah. that work. Yeah. Uh, so track. T it's funny you say, mentioned track T because that's what got Ian interested in the business too. He went to one of Jamie's seminars yep. years ago mm -hmm. and said, "I'm getting into this." So that's funny that you both share that same attribute. So you both mentioned partnerships, right? And partnerships can go a variety of ways. They can be either good, bad, and different. Uh, let's talk about some of those attributes you might look for in a partnership with somebody because there has to be, they have to align with you, right? Like they can't be on a different page or even in a different book. They have to align with like your core thoughts, strategies, ethics, models, et cetera. So Scott, what do you look for in, in a partnership? Yeah, you know, two broke people with bad credit that want to get into self-storage uh, together is not a good partnership. But yet that's what we see so many times, you know, two people excited about it. That doesn't really get you very far. So uh, the opposite of that is is complementing uh, you know, skill sets. And so if you are the acquisitions guy and you're looking for deals, um, whether existing facilities or land to develop, and then your partner brings either the operations side and that's their expertise and their strong suit, or they bring a stronger balance sheet, or they bring equity partners with them, you know, whatever that is, the, the, the further apart you could be in your skill sets, but aligned as close as possible in core values, that is probably the best partnership. Um, otherwise, if you have exactly the same, what ends up uh, the same and you're lacking or the, the same and you guys are both well-rounded, well, eventually somebody's going to feel um, inevitably as if uh, they're doing more of the work or the lion's share of the work and therefore they deserve more of the lion's or the lion's share of uh, the pie in terms of profits and cash flow. And so, mm -hmm. you know, understanding and having a good operating agreement where, you know, it, it starts on the whiteboard. Here's your skill sets. Here's mine. And uh, as the, the, the beer commercial says, uh, you know, two years ago, you know, stay in your lane, bro. And, and, and as long as you two stay in your respective lanes, you can provide input and direction where the business is going. But as soon as um, the construction guy comes over to the marketing guy or gal and says, hey, I don't like the yellow flags that you got out and, and half off the first month is that'll never work. And you can you know, point to the operating agreement and say, hey, we, we talked about this, you know, stay in your lane. This is where your strong suit. This is mine. And that really uh, it avoids those the confrontations and it, it inevitably avoids the business divorce. So uh, to summarize, just, you know, make sure that somebody that brings something to the table, not the same as you, uh, that complements you and, and, and makes uh, the whole better as a result of bringing that person into a partnership. Yeah, definitely. Jeremiah, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and, and Scott's spot on. And if, if I just, when we frame this talk, when we, this this episode, investors that want to get in and raise capital, if you're light on capital and you haven't been in the business and you want to do your first storage facility, look at the structure as a partnership, like Scott said, uh, and open up an LLC. You have a GP side that's the general mm -hmm. partner and you have the LP side. Right. And the mm -hmm. what I would say is in this in in relation to that, you are the GP. If you're the one that's mm -hmm. going to go find the, the, the deal and you're going to get the loan and guarantee it and you're going to take the, the sweat equity of, of getting the entitlements, the approvals, building your team, managing it, all of that. You know, that is you get to earn you get to earn equity in the deal, which is called the carry out in the private equity world. Right. You get to own your GP shares and then the LP shares. The limited partners, they're the capital partners. They're the ones that actually are putting up the cash. So typically the general partners have the voting interests. The LP partners don't have a lot, any really voting interest or decision-making capabilities. And this is, everything's different in, in every partnership, but this is somewhat of a standardized basic partnership. Mm -hmm. So on the LP side, the preferred shareholders, typically we call them A shareholders and the, and the other, the GPs or B shareholders, the A shareholders, they get paid first. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to remember that. So to incentivize these people where they say, hey, well, I'll give you half the money. You put up half the money and then let's do the deal. And you're like, well, that's not exactly how it works. I'm taking all the risk and I'm okay. actually having to build the business and I need that capital to grow the company. You're putting up the capital. So in return for you putting up the capital, you get a preferred return. So you're going to get all the profits first. Plus, you'll get a guaranteed or preferred amount of interest on that capital you invest. Mm -hmm. And in the past, it's been 10% for us where the first 10% of profits every year go to that person. And then once you get paid your 10% accrued preferred return, and then you get paid your capital back, 
Now we get to participate and split in the 50 50 in the equity. Got it. And, yeah, and there's sense. a lot more to go with that. But yeah, that's the basic framework of a typical, you know, GPLP uh, limited liability partnership. For sure. Now, let's say I'm a newer owner and I don't really have a large pool of friends and family that maybe I can go, um, you know, solicit this to. Where would I even begin to start to look for an investment partner? Do you have any suggestions? Well, well, for me, so, so like I looked real young. I didn't come from money. I got in real estate, right? I quit college. So I had no network, zero. And mm -hmm. what I did is went to a ton of networking groups, joined organizations like SBOA, went to every seminar I could learn about. So TRACD, uh, there was a, a commercial academy, was a, a, just a general commercial real estate education platform, you know, read Scott's uh, materials, read a lot of different materials on storage, and, and then went to these places, you know, over time. And it took me a long time. It took me about five years before someone actually, well, it took me a few years before they entrusted me with their money and then I hit it off with a couple from that worked for Microsoft up in Seattle. And it was just random where you make that one connection. They, they believe in you. And, and actually that investment didn't really work out that well. I, uh, I, <laughs> they didn't make a lot of money on the first one, but I made them whole and I made sure they got paid their capital back. And then in the end they valued that and, and they became a, they, they've invested over $10 million now. So it's just that one relationship over 10 years ago that, that scales when someone sees that you're, you're really passionate and you want to uh, learn this business. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, you have anything to chime in on that one too? Yeah, I think uh, really the same as Jeremiah in the beginning. It's uh, those relationships and uh, being in the room with the uh, folks and having them see and understand what it is that you're doing. Of course, you have to have a track record behind you of success. It really helps if you've bought facilities, several facilities, created value, and then exited and sold. And then you have that history and track record that you can show folks. That's always helpful. Uh, but even in the beginning, as you're starting out, a little bit different, quite honestly, than where Jeremiah and I started versus today. Today, it's about content. You've got multiple platforms where you can start a podcast, mm -hmm. where you can be putting out videos on YouTube that are searchable, how to, and then you talk about your own business and about what you're doing and what you have done, in addition to doing the same things that, that we've always done, which is uh, being in the room with folks. Uh, we've, we've had the benefit, uh, part of the benefit of our education platform is that although we, we teach people how to do this business actively, uh, many folks uh, recognize that eh, maybe I don't want to go into this full time or maybe I don't want to be the GP. Maybe I don't want to be on the side of taking on all of the debt risk, all of the, the lease up risk and bringing on my own private equity partners or borrowing money. Um, because I've got a, a full-time job or I've got this other gig over here and I can't, you know, I don't really have the time and the resources to be able to devote to this. And so maybe I'll take a backseat and, uh, and I'll be a passive investor. And so those folks that have come through different education platforms recognize that I can probably get a better return or about the same return that I would get investing passively, but in this asset class which that we love, self-storage, without actually actually being the active investor on that side. And so by default, there's a whole lot of folks that wanted to be active investors that end up being passive. And you just need to get in the rooms with those folks and be in front of them and then present these opportunities and let them know that, hey, you can still be a part of it. You can be an owner, an equity owner. You don't have to take all the risk. And here are those returns and the benefits you receive as a result of that still equity. You get the depreciation from a K-1 that rolls down through your personal tax return. So many of those benefits without uh, having to take on, do all the work and take on all that risk. Now, Scott, you have this whole mastermind group that you've developed. Tell me a little bit about that and how that might benefit a newer owner operator coming into the space, maybe aligning with your group. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, we, um, as, as Jeremiah talked about, you know, partnerships is the best way that we found to get into this business. And, and, and personally speaking, and maybe for some folks that are listening right now, I, I went kicking and screaming into partnerships because I always kind of operated on my own. And uh, of course, nobody can do anything as good as you can do it uh, and for your own business, but you recognize you're not going to go very far with that. And there's things that you are lacking in the beginning. And so uh, we put together a mastermind, which is somewhat self-serving in the beginning. When I got into the business, you know, as a solopreneur, we don't have a large staff. We don't have departments to go down and talk to about the challenges that we have. But we certainly can get a room with other owners and operators at different levels of experience of, of growth and stages of their career that we can lean on. We're going through challenges uh, together. We're celebrating successes together. But it's just access to everybody else's experience and their Rolodex, which means their private equity partners, their lenders, their brokers. So we, as we're building out our team, 
we can also tap into the teams of other folks that are in the room. And so our mastermind is a group of folks that are growing and scaling the self-storage business. And we're sharing best business practices. We're sharing capital sources and we're sharing deal flow. We, we can't all do all the deals that everybody has flowing through their organization. Some are too big or they just don't fit. But instead of, um, you know, if it's a, a portfolio that's too big or even that one facility that's the right size, but too far away from you, well, you can still monetize that by wholesaling it to somebody else in the mastermind or doing a joint venture, combining forces, or all of us in the room getting together and investing in a portfolio that maybe one or two people couldn't take down on their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the sum is uh, much uh, greater when you put everybody uh, together to be able to put some of these deals together so that things don't fall off anybody's desk and they go to somebody else outside of our ecosystem. That was, that was the whole goal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And you mentioned earlier, and I love this comment. You said, you know, everybody's like, I want, I need to find a deal. I need to find a deal. You said finding deal. It's not finding deals. Deals are made. Mm -hmm. um, and 100%. that's true. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me talk to you, Jeremiah, about this for a little bit. You said, mentioned in our planning call, just about your underwriting process. You want to know um, if that deal will profit enough within a three to five year exit, is, is that kind of like your overall strategy? Can you kind of walk me through that strategy and what you're, what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, right up front, you just got to make sure income expense and your NOI align with your expectations. I mean, those are the three critical drivers of any deal. And when you look at that, there's standards that you, you typically see patterns right around that. So, the big thing you got to underwrite right away is, especially with brokers right now, I think they're getting a little creative to make the deal look better than it is, where we're being a lot more conservative because, uh, I, and I think we've shared this in the past, Scott and I, that COVID accelerated this industry right. over the last few years and people coming into it need to realize that this industry didn't grow year over year, 20% in revenue. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, mm -hmm. that's not realistic, right? That's yeah. so, so these expectations about where market rents need to be some are somewhat unrealistic in my eyes, especially as new more, as more competition come on and more people mm -hmm. get more cost conscious, the consumer. So the brief answer to that, Jessica is, you know, know your market rents and, and that's, I'll break it down to a very basic uh, concept. Go out, call all the five mile competitors, go on Google, call them, look at their 10 by 10 rate, look at their 10 by 15 and look at their 10 by 20. That'll give you enough to say, okay, is this deal that I'm buying, are they projecting larger rents, 10, 20, 30% larger? Or is this, are we under market and they're projecting the rents that everyone else is at? And then you could be a few bucks over, five bucks over the other market rents if you have a better comp uh, competitive mm -hmm. advantage. It's a clean facility, but you can't project crazy rental rental uh, uh, projections right now because it's not realistic. So mm -hmm. know your revenue side and then know the expense side. The biggest ex uh, mistake that I think we both see, Scott and I, with newer individuals is they underestimate the, the cost to manage the asset. Mm -hmm. Because most of these assets that are under 50,000 square feet, you don't have the economies of scale. So you better put in there at least 35% in your expense ratio and maybe more depending on how you're managing it with labor. And that way, you know, and, and depending on tax too. So in the Northeast, we have really large property taxes and plowing expenses. So mm -hmm. certain markets, you're going to have mm -hmm. a high expense ratio. So you need to buffer in there all the expenses because one, that dictates what the value is going to be, right? The net operating income, that's really, we're all buying storage for that, that bottom line net operating income. That is it. If, I mean, there's mm -hmm. no reason to buy a big metal box for, you know, that doesn't generate you a, a cash flow. It's, it's pointless. So you sure. need to know th those metrics right in there that, and then you'll start to see those patterns. But if, if you, if, if really you don't under. Oh, we lost you there for a second. There you go. You're back. Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah. So those are the critical drivers of underwriting. And we could go even farther with that in terms of the debt side. But at least the asset itself, you really need to know what is what is really the income, the expenses, and then the actual net income so that you have a, a, a true cap rate on what you're assessing. Now, yeah. Now, Jeremiah, if, if you are looking at the deal and you're in that underwriting process and it doesn't look like it's going to profit enough for you in that three to five year hold. Do you abandon it? Do you decide to take the risk and maybe hold it a little bit longer? Like, tell me what you do there. 
Yeah, it, right now is a really exciting time in storage because when I started back in 2006 and seven, uh, the lenders weren't really lending uh, prevalently on storage. It wasn't that sexy of an asset class. Mm -hmm. And with, with lending right now transitioning and rates getting in the mid sevens and with the yesterday's increase with the Fed, maybe even eight, uh, that's going to cause owners that really want to sell to possibly owner finance. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is if you, can if you can analyze the asset value based on the operations, then you can start to get creative in the structure. So mm -hmm. you can really start to say, okay, maybe I'll pay a little closer to your price if you work with me on my terms. Mm -hmm. And these assets take a lot of hands-on management. So these owners can't just hire some third party and it's all gonna work out. I mean, a lot of times, unless it's a large, large asset, uh, then they're gonna typically not want to continue to run these assets for the next two, three, four years if they can't sell to a conventional buyer with uh, mm -hmm. and get a conventional loan. So that's that's where I'm kind of excited. So what I would do is, you know, a, keep the simple, keep it really simple. Put it in a tickler file, you know, Excel or whatever you do, Monday.com or any any database. Call them back at, at three months. I don't think a lot of is going to trade right now. I'd love to hear what Scott has to say, but I think for yeah. for us, we're buckling down for two more years. I, we're not seeing a lot of abilities to to sell assets at a premium mm -hmm. value anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Scott, let's hear your take on this. And do you follow kind of like the same parameters that Jeremiah does in the underwriting process or are yours different? Um, what do we have? Three hours left to talk about the I underwriting? Know. Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> this is like um, a day long session, right? Yeah, it is, it is the art and science behind the project. It is literally where the rubber meets the road from the acquisition mm -hmm. standpoint to then understanding where, where you can take it. You know, we have three sets of underwriting, you know, that we look at and, and you know, literally I, I, you know, we almost stand back and look at it laying on the desk or the floor and say, here's where it is now. This is our offer price. Here's where we can take it under our management, you know, which means, you know, in the next 30, 60 days when we put our best business practices in place and operations but then ultimately especially if we have private equity in it where are we taking it in that three four five year time frame and is there enough you know is there a big enough pot of money left at the end of a refinance um, or a sale that is going to generate enough uh, revenue to give our investors the returns that are you know commensurate to the market that get them to invest with us and so if that number is not there to your to your question just to to jeremiah you know this is where we have to get creative again and you know what does that look like how do we change the capital stack so we're, we're, we're dusting off our scripts and our strategies when it comes to seller financing because that is going to be you know at, at the forefront now um on our terms as jeremiah mentioned as well because uh, the banks you know we can go to them with a, a whole creative uh you know mix of things and they're going to take a look at that and say well that doesn't fit our box so no thank you but if we can go back to the seller and say if you're willing to hold some of this back at a five percent you know at this interest rate you know if you need to have this price you know, you've got one, you know, two options. You, you create more value and wait for interest rates to come down and then you can sell it two years from now or you can be creative and we'll sell it the deed across the table. But you've got to hold some of the paper on it. And here's what this looks like on, on our terms. And so the, the capital stack where, you know, recently we've had you know, two elements to that. It's private equity layered on top of debt. Now it's going to be private equity, perhaps layered on top of some MES financing, maybe some seller financing and the primary lender debt and or any combination of in order to get these deals across the finish line. If anybody has if anybody's selling right now to Jeremiah's point, probably have to sell. Um, but when mm -hmm. those come to the market, you know, it's up to us and or a broker to set some realistic expectations and then let them know if you're going to sell, if you're going to trade. Well, here's a debt service coverage ratio. I'm not trying to beat you up mm -hmm. on your price, but this is just, you know, this is all the lender is going to give us. So um, I'm not trying to undercut you on your price, but you either need to lower the price or we need to find a better way of uh, doing this. And so it's hanging in there. It's being creative and it's understanding the seller's needs truly to see if we can um, get to that place where uh, we actually can buy it. And, and if we have to walk away, then, yeah, you, you put them in your Rolodex, call them back later. And uh, if they've created value, great. If not, if interest rates have come down and cap rates are, are, are down with it, then now it makes sense to, to, to buy it. Great. Now we'll transact the deal. Got it. Now, Scott, you've been doing real estate syndication for a long time. How did you even get started in this process? And what was that like when you got started? Yeah, well, if you want to grow, you will run out of cash eventually. So you have to learn how <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the bottom line. Um, so 
yeah, we, we recognized pretty quickly that um, we were gro- our, our business was growing. And if we wanted to do more facilities, yeah, we, we you run out of cash, you run out of re- your own retirement dollars that you can tap into. And so strategically looking at uh, the partners that, that bring something to the table, um, our first one was an equity partner that actually came into the partnership on, on the GP side. So they were making decisions with us. They brought their equity into our, our deal and we were doing things uh, in tandem. Then the, the next facility that we bought, uh, at that point, we were we were both uh, at our limits in terms of capital. So then we went out and created the GPLP structure mm-hmm. in a true Reg D, you know, SEC Reg D 506B uh, plan is what we put together at that point, a fund, uh, just a syndication fund, a single asset uh, fund to go out and raise capital. And again, it was friends and family money. And that's a term that is used in the in the industry, which means it's not institutional money. It's folks that you have in your inner sphere and in your circle or, or influence with. And so it was, it was, it was friends and it was family and it was other folks, uh, again, that we had uh, been doing business with that knew of us that we put uh, the project in front of, showed them the, the returns and um, said, if you, if this is something that interests you, then here's how you go about investing in this. And then walking them through the process, showing how, them how to convert an old um, 401k into a self-directed IRA to invest with us and the benefits of, you know, depreciation and what it looks like for them and just, you know, kind of advising them a little bit as to what it looked like to be able to invest in ours, let alone uh, anybody else's, if that was uh, something they were interested in doing and opening up another world for them. So for that, we really became, I guess, known for showing people that there's other ways to invest in real estate or, or invest for retirement that doesn't have to be in Wall Street, that they can invest in other asset classes and alternative investments. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, Jeremiah, you guys are on what your fourth fund already? Yeah, yeah. It, it, and I started the first 10 years of my career minimum was in all these individual partnerships. And it got to a point where, you know, you'd have a handful of partners anywhere from three to 10 on each deal. And as you start getting 30, 40 different LLCs, you got 30 or 40 different projects to report on, you got 40 different K1s. Uh, so it gets, well, 40 times five partners on each one. You got mm-hmm. you know, up to 100 different K1s because you're given one on each asset. So it's just administratively, it got really challenging. So, so for me, the fund structure was very focused and clear that we are going out and buying storage. We buy some manufactured housing, but this is exactly what I've done. Say that last part one more time. I lost you at the end. You're good. It's just coming in and out. I got. I know. I, I I know. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, no, but I'm doing the same thing I've done for 10 years. So now we're just doing it in a way where we have the, the certainty that the capital is available to us and that, that that capital we can go deploy as soon as we find a great opportunity. So it's really abiding by the guidelines of this. We buy storage. They're good deals, value add. These are the return projections. And we want to we want to aggregate that capital. We want to collect it and have it available. And then we then as soon as we find a good deal, boom, we can go deploy it. We don't have to go out and pitch each person on the deal and make sure every time we get a series of people to agree and then they fund right before the deal closes. That's not a bad thing. In the beginning, I think you should do that mm-hmm. so that the deal yeah. itself mm-hmm. has merit, right? But then mm-hmm. if you've earned the ability to actually go out and deploy the capital and you don't need someone over your shoulder watching everything you buy uh, and the incentives are aligned properly where the they're aligned where you as the fund manager or the GP, you don't make money just by raising money. You make money mm-hmm. by actually producing mm-hmm. profits right above and really above outstanding profits, you know, above market profits, then, then, then you earn your right to get that fee or the, the equity. Mm-hmm. So, so that, that was my transition kind of the ro- the way that I evolved into actually getting into a fund versus the partnerships. Gotcha. And I just want to remind the audience, we have about 20 minutes left. If you guys have questions for Scott or Jeremiah, now is your time to ask them. We've got the experts here with us. Please don't be shy. Chat those questions in the chat area. They would love to answer them, I'm sure. Uh, Let me ask you both. Do you guys only work with accredited investors or do you ever take a step to what I'll call the dark side? (laughs) 
I, I, I don't know if I would call it the dark side so much, but the, yeah, it, yeah. it makes me nervous. There's a risk <clears throat> side, right? <laughs> so. so just just so people are are, are clear, accredited investors um, are investors that have over a million net, net worth and they make a certain amount of uh, income per year. And so this is a governed by and, and those terms are set by the SEC, Securities mm -hmm. and Exchange Commission. That's uh, basically when you're bringing in accredited investors, uh, there's a certain level of sophistication and experience and they have a, a, a certain amount of net worth so that they can invest and you can feel comfortable with them, but then also they don't have a whole lot of protection from the SEC. So in other words, against somebody uh, it, like uh, Jeremiah or myself or unlike us, who may be nefarious and do something you know that they didn't meet the projections or they didn't adhere to the operating agreement or what they had stated they were gonna do in the PPM, and those investors can go after them uh, because they were doing some things that there were, you know, some improprieties. And the SEC, they don't want to get involved in a lot of those suits. And they say, well, you are an accredited investor. You should know better. And so we're not going to expend our resources and in, in attorneys to go after an audit of these folks. Now, in, in a Reg D 506B, you can bring in unaccredited investors. And those are folks that are be below those thresholds. Um, but the risk that you take is that they do have some protection from the SEC. And if you do scream foul or enough of those uh, unaccredited investors that do scream foul because you didn't perform the way that you stated within your fund, your PPM, then they can they can draw upon the SEC to go after you and they can get some protection and perhaps claw some of that back and uh, make the bad guy pay for what he <laughs> perhaps may or may not have done. That's probably the best way of looking at it. So, yeah. um, so your question was just, do we do that? Uh, we started out doing 506 Bs because um, we had an awful lot of friends and family in our circle. And in the beginning, our very first one was a 506 B fund because we didn't want to advertise. Um, it was expensive at that point. We didn't know how well that would go, but we did know that we had an awful lot of folks in our inner circle, just family and friends and that, that didn't meet the accredited threshold, but wanted to come alongside of us and be able to participate in that project. But mm -hmm. I think to date, we, I think we've only done maybe two 506 Bs and everything else since then has been 506 C. And right now every, everything is uh, with uh, unac or accredited investors only. Gotcha. How about yeah. you, Jeremy? Same yeah. thing? Yeah, that, it's a good question. Um, and Scott really articulated it well. So if you're doing a partnership, so Jessica, you have a half million bucks uh, with your partners and you want to go buy uh, an individual storage facility on your own and you've known these people, you have chains of email, their acquaintances, you, there's a, re, there's a pre-existing relationship with these people that you can prove. You, you, you don't need to, to register as an exempt security with the SEC. You're not doing a fund. It's, it's not, you're not uh, raising a, a fund at all. You're doing a partnership together. So mm -hmm. just, uh, but where you got to be careful is you can't go advertise. You can't, you, there's like Scott saying, you cannot get on social media and say, I'm, I'm raising funds for storage projects mm -hmm. uh, because that, you, 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 that the only way you can do that is through the 506C process where when people come in and you've promoted yourself and they say, I'm, I want to invest, we have to ask them to accredit them. Like you, we need your accreditation and there's third party websites that they can input their information or they can provide a certain criteria from their attorney or accountant. And that mm -hmm. accredits them that now we can work together. But I advertise to you and now you, you found me through this method and now you've been vetted and accredited. So I'm in compliance with, with mm -hmm. the SEC. So just people really should understand the difference between that area. So in the beginning, you know, I didn't advertise and, Actually, this week is there's a lot of uh, legislative changes happening right now with uh, advertising mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. And it, this will shake out over the next two weeks, especially after the elections, because uh, and I don't know. Please talk to a securities attorney. You know, and if you guys recommend attorneys through the network, you know, that would be helpful for people, because mm -hmm. the big thing that people got in, in, in trouble with is uh, a Donald Trump or a, a The Rock, Dwayne Johnson or any of these people that they would they would associate their fund with a celebrity or with someone else with some loose loosely based association mm -hmm. and then that in turn would make it they would validate what they did but that's not really you know I mean, that you still have to abide by the rules of, of yeah. accrediting people so you just I think in the future we got to be very careful you know right now with social media uh, not not to be I mean you can still present what you do and educate people about storage. But in regards to fundraising, you know, even myself, I'm looking at what are these new regulations on how we articulate it? Can, yeah. can I add one piece to that, Jess, as well? Sure. Jeremiah is 100 percent correct. And, and the one other piece to that is that you can bring these folks in as partners, but 
they can't it can't be a, a situation where either jeremiah or i are active and that partner is is passive so yes you have to prove that relationship but also if you're bringing them in as partners they truly need to be involved in the decision making process because the mm -hmm. sec's definition is um one person active and another person passive well then that is a security you've created a security by that nature as well so it mm -hmm. has to pass that test um, so I just want to make that one other clarification just uh, to Thanks, make sure that Scott. everybody's in compliance. Yep. Yeah, yeah no, so. it's crucial these days, right? No one wants to get their hands slapped. <laughs> yeah, we live in a litigious society, do we not? Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness gracious, do we live in a litigious? I Yes, I'll echo that one. We sure do. Uh, so let's, I'm going to talk about social media for a minute because I got these stats from one of Jeremiah's social media posts. Jeremiah's looking for value added properties. So you've got a very defined list of criteria here, Jeremiah. You want at least 20,000 net rentable square footage, built after 1980, at least $10 a square foot gross rent, low economic occupancy, 50,000 plus median household income, and then certain amounts of population within that one, three, five mile radius. How did you derive those parameters in this process as you were you know, coming up with this strategy? Doing bad deals. <laughs> <laughs> Good yeah. answer. That's yeah. the best answer of the day. <laughs> yep. A lot of bad deals. Uh, okay. So okay. just follow that. That's it. You better. Yeah. That, the whole, that's the, just like Bill Belichick with the Patriots. Do your job. Follow the rules. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Don't stray. Th that, yeah. Those are my criteria. So that's, that, that's, I would suggest you follow them. Yeah. Scott, is your, are your parameters kind of similar to Jeremiah's or yours different? Almost spot on. I mean, in the beginning, we, we took a look at what the SSA was uh, putting out in terms of a development. Now, it's, it's different for acquisition because for a development, uh, you know, they have a certain set of parameters for everything, you know, uh, in terms of what a market looks like and uh, demand and square footage per capita and those types of things. And so we kind of set our benchmarks there. Uh, median income, yeah, forty five to 50000 and above. We want that certain... Um, we want a certain population. We'd like to see some growth as well. That's not critical as long as there's some there. We do look at what's existing. Um, but yeah, every, everything else, you know, we're looking for value add. And, and so Jeremiah's list is almost the same as ours. You know, we have to be able to um, raise rents. There's got to be room to push rents. If their economic occupancy is uh, low, that means that the, they've made friends with all their, their clients, their tenants, and they don't want to move anybody out. It allows the new sheriff to come in and to be able to raise rents and clean up the accounts uh, receivable and, and move some of these uh, folks out. So all, all of those things. So, yeah, the, uh, the the market is a good educator, as Jeremiah just uh, pointed out. And so, yeah, you need to stick to it. It's it, it, it's interesting because we've had some folks that say, well, we looked at this facility and the the, the rent they were stuck at 60 percent occupancy and, and the rents were you know way low from what we could an anticipate or what we've seen. I said, well, compared to who? Well, just, you know, what we've seen a, on a national average. And then, you know, we kind of dig back into their project and we recognize that, you know, the rents were right in market in line with the market and everybody else in a three mile radius was at 60 percent because uh, a couple of folks overbuilt. And so they were stabilized, you know, so that mm -hmm. rental rate that they were at, that's the market rate. And their occupancy was also the market occupancy. So they didn't have room to move up just because they saw 60 percent and thought they could go here or felt that this rate was low and they could take it up higher. Um, you don't know until you you dig in a little bit further. So there's there's two pieces to commercial real estate and and income producing properties. You know there's the asset you need to take a look at, uh, and then there and the NOI it produces. But then the market, where can you take it? If you're in the value add, you need to know what the market is producing and and where you can take it afterwards. And that sometimes is a critical piece that people miss is that um, will will the market support your growth projections? Yeah. And Je yeah, just to that, just just to hammer like like so people those, those that criteria that I mentioned and it's kind of the common denominator with, with, I think what good, good investors want out of storages, like, like mm -hmm. Scott and I, uh, number one, visibility. And what I mean by visibility is you gotta be, be near trades. So be near Walmart, tractor supply, dollar general hospitals, big multifamily housing, just have activity. Don't be that, that facility mm -hmm. way out in the middle of nowhere. Right. I mean, I, I've, I've bought those, Sometimes you luck out on those, but in this market, just be picky. So visibility, be somewhere where people are in the town where there's other services. And then, and then number two is you've got to have somewhat size. Like you have to be able to scale this thing. It's, you're going to waste all your time mm -hmm. if you buy one of these in a little Midwest town with one or two mm -hmm. buildings. 
Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything, right? You can mm -hmm. only, what are you going to squeeze out $200 a month in cash flow and you're, you have to manage it all. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's got it. You've got to hit that. If you can hit the 50,000 square feet and you can have four buildable acres, even with the single story with the stormwater retention, that 50,000 is great. You're not too big. You're not too small. Mm -hmm. You can pull out 10 grand a month. You and your investors share it five and five. Like that's, that's worth doing. So don't do anything that you can't get to that 40 or 50,000 feet. That's very important. And then lastly is, is competition. So it's, it's, this game is a supply driven game in the sense that there's demand. We've all seen it. Americans consume, they can't stop. Mm -hmm. Amazon's not going away. People and people are going to lose homes. People are going to move in together. That's, that's a given, but, it, but the flip side of it, the business it's market within a market. And your market is very individual. Florida, in certain parts of Florida, have 20 to 30 square feet per person. And it still does okay. So for certain parts of the Northeast where I'm at, have five to seven square feet per person. And we have barely have enough mm -hmm. demand to fill up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you've got to know who is your competition, how do you line up, and be under. For me, be, even if you're in a dense market, be under that, you know, 10, 7, 8, 9, 10 square feet per person. Be, you want to make sure there's not a ton of supply in that market and really think about can can people just come in and build like no problems. That's your biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. There's got to be like a, some type of barrier to entry, the economic moat that that uh, good old Buffett shares about. Your business has to have some barrier to entry so that everybody can't flood it when things get good again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just those are the, the main things to look at on a site. Mm -hmm. If you have all three of those. You know, Scott and I, we, we would invest in it. I mean, that's yep. what we're all looking for every mm -hmm. single day. Hey, yeah. Jeff, I, I just have to share real quick. Um, when yeah. I got into the business, there was a, a, a gray haired gentleman that had been in the business for a number of years that I was chatting with. And uh, in regards to as Jeremiah was talking about uh, location and being near the trades, he says, I won't build or buy anywhere unless I can see a Walmart and smell McDonald's. <laughs> I said, that that sums it up, and I, well I, I said, you know, yeah, very very clear. That's <laughs> awesome. No, I love that. And so, I mean, are are you finding challenges? Because I feel like a lot of uh, sophisticated investors or people in self storage are, are looking for those value add properties. So you're one of 1 million people out there or more looking for like the same identical property asset, you know, structure. Is it making it more challenging? Because every time I talk to somebody, what are you looking for? Value add, value add, value add. I'm like, yeah, you and everyone else, <laughs> you know? So I, I mean, I feel like it's becoming more challenging to find this type of asset. I, I'll tell you when it when it gets to be that way, Jess. But it, we haven't right now. Our our pipeline has uh, continued to remain strong, That's and good. you know we've got really good folks that are pounding the phones and and finding uh, opportunities. And you know we got our marketing dialed in and our direct mail. You know, so we're hitting all fronts. Uh, brokers know what we're looking for, and we really you know our broker relationships and other folks that are in the market. We said, hey, send us your junk, meaning the stuff that your buyers um, won't be able to get across the finish line because, you know, it's a mess. The occupancy is a uh, low, um, you know, the lenders won't like it. The debt service coverage ratio isn't there compared to the equity that they bring to the table. You know, we can buy those for cash and turn them around and take it from a, you know, 30 or 50% occupancy up to here. Um, mm -hmm. Give us that stuff. But then also, you know, going back to what we discussed uh, earlier on, and that is uh, there's a whole lot of folks that say, well, I can't find value add. And, you know, we could look and be looking at the same offering memorandum listing uh, and not even get to the underwriting. And we can see based upon, you know, these averages and some of these numbers that, oh, wait a minute, you know, I think there's a value here, even if that cap rate looks low look at their economic occupancy or look at their, the physical or, you know, as Jeremiah mentioned earlier, well, yeah, there's another three or four acres, you know, on this thing. And so well, I'm mm -hmm. going to take it from here to here. And so I'll pay that four cap or five cap now because it's going to be a 12 cap by the time I finish it out. And so, you know, it's peeling back the layers of the onion, knowing what to look for on the surface, but then also really knowing what to look for in the underwriting process to see, you know, where you can take it from the time you buy it. Because I, you know, we buy properties and projects at a 0% cap rate, but I can take it up to here within a year to four years. And, and that's that's where the value you know comes in is uh, later on. And the more that you have to do to it, the more value you create. So it's I mean, there's there's a number of ways to answer that question, Jess, but uh, they're still mm -hmm. out there. And, and until we're not finding deals, I'll, I'll let you know. But right now we're you know, we're, it's still pretty strong and pretty robust. No, I love that. Uh, we actually have a couple Jess. questions coming in from the audience. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Oh, yeah. No. And I, I just I think depending on the audience type in here, if they want to be 
the lead and they want to grow their own storage business versus, you know, investing in storage. And, and there's, you know, Scott puts it really well. It's, it's a true business. It's like a retail business. I mean, you are, it is nonstop. You, it's not it's hard, but it's, you can't just check out. So, you know, yeah. just everyone really needs to really understand that, you know, you're not going to hire cube smart mm -hmm. and they're, it, it, they're going to manage it and it's all, it's all taken mm -hmm. care of. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a minimum, you know, 40, what is it? Uh, 2,500 bucks a month minimum on their fee plus a $70,000 mm -hmm. payroll and mm -hmm. plus their management and, 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 uh, uh, advertising fee. So there's mm -hmm. like $120,000 in management cost right out of the gate. So just that's the commitment you have to have when you get into this business, if you really think you're going to do it. And then I, we're tight on time, Jess, but the one thing that the opportunity in the next two years, you know, going mm -hmm. back to that old Tracti seminar is there's a million pieces of land in suburban markets that just exploded during mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. So the like, I mean, Scott said it well with the with the Walmart and, and the McDonald's right now, land stops. People mm -hmm. are unless it's mm -hmm. a best, the really premium piece yeah. of land. Mm -hmm. These these choice pieces of land in suburban markets mm -hmm. are right there, take right for the taking and they're not going to mm -hmm. sell. So if you go, if you really know your stuff, you dial in the SBA relationship, you have your lender relationship, you have people that will give you a half million dollars or you can save up part of that. You can come into these. And you don't even need all that money. You can go to the seller and say, hey, I'm mm -hmm. going to build this storage. This mm -hmm. is the layout. Show them some of the pictures from Tracti. I'm going to get 400 units. It's going to make 40 grand a month in income. You're, you're an investor with me. And then we're going to build it together. You're going to put up the land, but you're a priority shareholder here in the partnership. And then I'm going to do all the other work. And then you're going to get paid first, but it's going to be a profitable venture. And this is just sitting there and you're paying taxes on it. So let's go through the process. And let me let, give me the time to go get this thing approved, you know, get it engineered, get it approved. And then we're going to build it and it's going to be a good value. It's going to be a good business on this site. And but th that that there, that's not get rich quick. That's not flashy. You know that. And that is a tough road. I mean, no one. Luckily, you're in the middle of town. So people will know you're there. But it's a tr you're building a business from the ground up. But in the end, you're building. It's worth the wait because you got a brand new asset in a good area of town, in a good suburban market, and you have something that for 30 years, you have almost no CapEx if you build mm -hmm. it to today's specs. Yeah. So you have a generational asset. So if you if people are committed to that, then, then just be patient, find the right site, and then take the time to build it. And I'm just saying, though, that, that this isn't easy, you know, that, that, but that, that's a very big opportunity. If you're not worried about getting huge, just do one at a time, and this is the way to start. We're, we're doing one of those right now, Jeremiah, and just said uh, the, the owner is contributing the land as equity and we're building on top of it. So that's a that's a real thing. It's a real example. And yeah, don't don't confuse the fact that this is a simple, predictable business model with it being an easy business because uh, th those are two counterpoints. Yeah, definitely. you have to treat it like a business, too. Right. Mm -hmm. Like John Minas from uh, Pinnacle says it best. Like this is a sales business. Mm -hmm. Charge admin fees, charge late fees. Don't let Aunt Sally be late for six months because she's rented with you for 10 years. Like mm -hmm. you have to treat it like a business and you can't mm -hmm. make those exceptions because if you keep making those exceptions, they become the rule. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me get to these two audience questions and I'm going to wrap us up for the sake yep. of time. I want to be respectful to your time. So, Brian, I know. And Brian's steadily looking for deals right now. He's like, what's working best? Direct mail, text, email, or random cold calls? I know, Brian. Come on, Brian. You've been doing this for years. You know what works, <laughs> bud. <laughs> um, I, it's calling. It's, it's, it's again, banging the phones. You know, our, our direct mail is uh, pulling some things, but it's really just the phone calls. I mean, seven touches is what uh, our call center is, um, is is utilizing right now to get in touch with the folks. So yeah, yeah, Brian, call it a random cold call, but um, you know, it's our list. We've got our list and our database that we've been uh, hitting on a regular basis. Um, SMS, if you can get it, you know, just about anything on our website right now, when somebody opts in for something, whether it's a free download, a free book, uh, access to our webinar, we're getting phone numbers for everything because 80% uh, of uh, texts are read, whereas 13% of emails are read and responded to. And so um, those are real numbers. And we, we take that from the passive side from our equity partners. And, and we're utilizing that on our on our acquisition side as well. Look, he redeemed himself here. Yeah. He's asking yeah. for yeah. the period. Of course, for because, uh, yeah, Brian, Brian's pretty seasoned. He knows. <laughs> Brian does know. He knows his stuff for sure. No. And then I, I'll, I'll shoot this one over to you guys. Uh, do you guys like conversion projects? Yeah. Good yeah. to go. Go ahead, Jeremiah. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, yeah, if you can get them approved. So I got to fly to freaking Augusta, Maine in a few weeks and I get to present again because we got denied and I'm two, almost 200 grand deep in architectural uh, designs, renderings, different fees. Uh, so, you know, the markets where it's best are the hardest to get and to get the asset or the box at a cheap enough price under 35, 50 bucks a foot, depending on your final rent that you can mm -hmm. charge is very challenging. So I would say um, don't jump the gun because, you know, if you can get it cheap and a town will give it to you right away, a lot of times it's a junk market. You don't want to be there. And th that's just my, I don't, I don't, I don't, I've done that many, I've, it's, but the ones that I really want, if you can, if you can get them at a favorable price and these are good markets that don't allow a lot of storage and you can get the approvals, I mean, absolute home run. Yeah, I'll just answer that a different way. The same, but different. Um, first of all, we have contingencies in place. And so we're not going to take that. We're not going to have the deed cross the table until we get that thing entitled. Uh, we've got it approved. Um, we don't buy boxes that are zoned for industrial and storage falls under that. Uh, we wait until we get entitled. Mm -hmm. Then they've given us a green light to the project because we did that once. Uh, on a building and it was in a, it, it, we had the zoning in place and, but then all of a sudden the city just said, no, um, we don't feel that people should have that much stuff and they should just throw it away and we don't want storage in our town. And I said, well, it falls underneath this. It says, yes, but read this. And so what we had to do is um, we put storage on three of the four floors and then we had to do co-working space for retail um, on the lower floor creative. and it doesn't generate as much revenue. It is creative mm -hmm. and it'll be a cool, fun project. And of course our marketing, you know, shows that this is what we, because we're so smart, decided to do from the beginning. However, um, to Jeremiah's point, the city gets to dictate that. And so I don't mm -hmm. think um, you sign on the dotted line. You can put an LOI in place or you know, a purchase agreement, but don't close on that thing until your due diligence mm -hmm. um, includes the entitlement and, and you're, you got permits in hand to be able to move forward with that. Uh, that's it's just too risky, no matter what the zoning is, even if, if uh, storage falls underneath it when you mm -hmm. buy it, because the city can do anything they want with it until you get final permit approval to move forward. And yeah. we're having, yeah, to, to hit Scott's point, exactly. Now we're having to add concessions. So we're building a yeah. public park out in the front, yeah. presenting that, <laughs> you course. know, so oh, yeah. Wow. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we're still getting pushback from that and re remodeling and revitalizing the inline retail next to it, yeah. that was next to the Kmart box. Uh, so, and, we're, and that's, it's not a sure thing. So in this climate, I would, uh, beginners, uh, be careful jumping into that. Mm -hmm. But what Scott said mm -hmm. is if you can tie it up and, and right now there's no reason you can't, but, but you right. are into it for some, some fees if you have to submit a detailed mm -hmm. application to a municipality. Mm -hmm. but, but if you can get it approved, I mean, you're, there is a lot of value creation there. Yeah. And Jeremiah, you should negotiate. Uh, once they approve it, uh, the caveat is, and they get to have um, a, 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 at least a bust or a sculpture of you in that park once it's uh, done somewhere <laughs> for them forcing you to go through that. Uh, that should be that, the, the counter. I love that idea. I think that's All right. Great. All well, right. Guys, yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we are out of time. I feel like this topic could go on and on forever. For the audience out there, next week, Thursday, November 10th, we have another storage for rookie session from 12 to 5. If you're a newer owner operator in the space, I highly recommend, highly recommend them. I can't talk. I'm done. I highly <laughs> recommend. There we go, that you attend next Thursday. And then the Thursday after that, we will have another episode of Self Storage Unlocked talking all about the legal issues that you can run into with a self storage facility. Thank you guys again, Scott, Jeremiah. Always a pleasure talking with you. You guys are brilliant mm -hmm. minds in the space. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with these individuals, their links will be in our uh, video replay tomorrow that will be on the SBOA YouTube channel. So if you want to get in touch with Scott's team or Jeremiah's team, highly encourage you to do that as well. You guys have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Good stuff, Scott. See you, Jeremiah. See you